Well, back to our top story now. At Scott Morrison has given some reasoning for swearing himself in secretly to several portfolios during the height of the pandemic. And joining us live now is the former Labor Senator Stephen Conroy. Stephen, good morning to you. So, um, so he's given his response uh, on, on a few different fronts here. He basically said that... He made this reference about keys. So, when you've got an emergency, it's better to have two keys than one key. So, it's a safeguard mechanism. If someone like Peter Dutton got COVID at the time when it was feared that this thing was getting out of control, it was a safeguard me mechanism. So, what, what's your thoughts on his explanation of things this morning? Well, look, there's a couple of different points. Uh, I mean, I was immediately on alert when I saw the Governor General actually not answer the questions that he was being asked and just give a generic answer, which implied there were more ministries that he swore himself into. So I don't think the Prime Minister or former Prime Minister has yet told the full truth uh, about what he got up to. I mean, it, it does seem like he wanted to be able to walk into the bathroom in the morning, look in the mirror and go, OK, have it up, we've got a quorum, we're off. Uh, so he might want to try and say that on health, you could possibly make an argument you needed the two keys to use that point. But why would you not tell the Australian public? Why would you sway yourself in secretly and ensure that it didn't become public? The gazettal process is a standard process. He must have interfered with the gazettal process uh, to inform the public. So he actually made a conscious decision to stop a process. I, I don't buy the finance issue. Uh, I, I don't think it's it's a credible argument to yeah. talk about the financial well, instruments yeah. needed. Yeah, just just and, to bring just to bring our viewers up to speed there. Yeah, so so basically, as we all know, the health remember, remember they were given godlike powers at the time. Um, yep. Greg Hunt was given those godlike powers, so he says, well, it's best to have a backup there on finance as well. The point that you're about to make, he says, similar. Similarly, they had huge financial powers, so it's. It's better to have someone as a backup. Where Josh Frydenberg would have fit in there, I'm not sure. But what? But what? Yeah. So, so carry on with your point there. Yeah. So on on, on finance, I, I just don't buy that argument at all. Uh, I mean, he can keep trying to make it, but then you move into the next swag of portfolios, and it is clear that he is not. The pandemic is not the overarching yeah. reason that he has done this. He has interfered because. What your listeners want to understand is, in a piece of legislation, a cabinet decision is not a legal authority. It act, that's why legislation specifies individual ministers have to have legal authority. That way you can legally challenge an individual minister's decision. So he knew exactly what he was doing. He wanted to stop Keith Pitt approving this development. So instead yeah. of having a discussion, having a cabinet, he actually breaks the coalition agreement because the coalition agreement says that the National Party have this and he gives himself the powers and then he uses those powers in a way that is now being challenged in court. And now it's more clear why that company is so aggrieved because the minister yeah. with the actual officially delegated power was absolutely rolled by the Prime Minister to help his political mate. Yeah, well, Matt so Canavan on the show... This just smellier. Yes, sorry, sorry, Stephen. Yeah, Matt Canavan was on the show a short time ago. He basically said that th this, is, this decision has been made not in the national interest but in MPs' self-interest, which would also include the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. They put self-interest above the national interest in making a decision about PEP 11. Yeah, look, it, it's hard to disagree with Matt on that one. Uh, Matt would have been very conscious of this. He's, he's been a resources minister. He knows all the issues. He knows the things you have to consider. Uh, and whether or not your mate has been pre-selected or about to be pre-selected in a particular seat is not usually a grounds <laughs> that will stand up in court. So if I was that company, I would be deeply aggrieved and I can understand why they're taking it to court because it's not a decision based on the merits of the information that was available to the minister at the time. And then there's this suggestion, and I, I, I couldn't quite work out from what he said this morning, did he swear himself in his defence? Uh, is that what he's actually but saying? Yes, I Peter don't Dutton know. was sick. Yeah. So I don't know about that one. I, I haven't listened to the whole interview, but because uh, we've been here, but, uh, but Peter Dutton had denied yesterday. Well, no, he said to his knowledge... 
To his knowledge. To his knowledge, uh, Morrison didn't swear Van himself into the fence. Peter Van Olsen is in the paper this morning uh, saying there's going to be more revelations about more ministerial portfolios he swore himself into. OK, so are we, are we Can getting... you imagine swearing yourself in as a defence minister and not telling the existing defence minister? I mean, that's... That's extraordinary. I mean, Peter Dutton, the, the vote of no confidence in Peter Dutton there is <laughs> just resounding. So, what I mean, has he broken... Has, have any constitutional rules actually been broken here? Well, look, I think the Governor-General has to explain why these instruments weren't publicised. There is a, a normal formal process. You know, Governor-General... When a bill's passed by Parliament, that's not actually its implementation. I've, I've been in what they call Executive Committee. I've taken the bills to the residence of the Governor-General sat with the Governor-General, had a discussion. The Governor-General's then signed the uh, the bill. That's the formal assent. Now, Parliament, you know, this will be a, a very odd quirk to you. To Parliament isn't the final decision-maker on when a bill becomes law. It's the signature of the Governor-General. So these instruments are legal authority. So when he gives legal authority to these, normally they're a published document. So I think the Governor-General uh, has showed very poor judgments not in stopping the Prime Minister, but trying to ensure that the formal process of gazetting a decision is available to the Australian public. Uh, and if there's more, uh, well, I think both the Governor-General needs to explain his thinking, and I think Scott Morrison's answers become more and more threadbare. Well, I mean, I think... Th uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think things have become even more murkier following that interview this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's, he, yeah, as I said... Most people would say, OK, in health... Health, you know, fine, yeah. Bad, yeah, health is OK, but why do you keep it secret? Sure. Uh, but then as you move into finance, you move into resources, I mean, the pandemic argument really doesn't stack up. Uh, so I think the Prime Minister is going to need to run yeah. a press conference where he can be asked and be required to tell the full truth, not just the, the murky little hiding behind references that he's made this morning. Well, Asset Energy has claimed that it was denied procedural fairness because Morrison's, because Morrison's argument was biased and they weren't aware that Morrison was actually the minister. So for an issue that was probably dead and buried for a lot of people is now well and truly alive when it comes to PEP 11 and, and uh, trying to source gas off the New South Wales coast, which, as we know, is, is needed now given the current crisis. Yeah, no, I, I think if I was a company, I'd be feeling I'd be feeling very buoyant. I mean, the fact that the press release didn't mention Keith Pitt, the fact that the Prime Minister, and this again, we, you know, a lot of things were going on before that election. Uh, but yeah. when the Prime Minister says, I've got the authority, that should have been a red flag because the Prime Minister doesn't have the authority under the legislation, except if he has sworn himself in. So he's even been... Uh, deceitful when he made the announcement and gave the press release. So, yeah. I mean, a court will ultimately decide this, but th yeah. if a court overturns the Prime Minister's decision, then you'd have to say the Prime Minister has acted outside the law. Uh, just, just a final one, Stephen, I've gone well over, but I, I, do, I am interested in this, in this answer. It, does, so the, 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 the government now pursues this, in your view, given the fact that we've got a cost-of-living crisis, we've got all these other current issues that are affecting day-to-day -day, day -day issues that are affecting Australians. Is this a, 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 an issue that is worth pursuing there vigorously? Two, there were two big issues in the campaign. One was about integrity and one was about cost of living. Uh, the Australian public is cynical. Uh, and this is this goes to the core fabric of how a democracy can survive. Yeah. So I think the truth is necessary in this instance. Right. You don't have to have a royal commission, but the truth and an explanation from the former Prime Minister are necessary for the for the integrity of governmental processes. There's a whole bunch of checks that he has just literally tossed in the bin. Sure. The core issues around cost of living, we've got the job summit, jobs and skills summit, we've seen discussion about increased migrant intake so that we can get more skills in the country. The government can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yep. The public deserves the truth. Integrity is a big issue in the last election. This goes to the core of it.